Hello, my name is Nigel Gravis. I work at IBM Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This is a first look at IBM Power 8 machine called a S822LC. Now, unfortunately, IBM Marketing have decided to call four different machines the same S822LC. The two and the two means that there are two Power 8 sockets and it's 2U high. So they do share that in common, but we now have to include the machine type on the model name, the 8001-22C, which is not easy to remember, to be quite honest. Remember, this is an open power box. This is a Linux-only machine. There's no HMCs or PowerVM in here, but we do have IPMI and we have the Unix KVM for virtualization. I've been helped by Mike Pearson to make this movie. So it's a 19-inch rack. Um, this is obvious, if you have a look at it, is produced by Supermicro as part of their ultra server range it runs uh, intel in the past now we have a new motherboard and the new cpu so much higher performance with power 8 the internal name is called a briggs and it's 2u high in the rack there's a variation of this which is 1u high which is something new for power 8 it's called a strata machine these two machines uh, share a lot of components on a sort of quick visual look um, the motherboard looks exactly the same if you slice the top off a of briggs you'd end up sort of with a, a strata machine. Less space for discs, less space for adapters, but uh, otherwise a lot in common. We're now going to have a quick live look around the outside of the machine. We'll lift the lid and we'll show you the dismantling of some of the major components so you can have a look around. And then we'll look at the details of the various options for the CPU, the memory, the disc and the adapters. The front view is dominated by all the 12 discs. These are hot swappable, provided you're not actually using them at the time. A handle and a logo on the right, on the left, the handle, an on-off switch, and six LEDs that report status and errors. Here's around the back of the machine. It's all neat and tidy. We we're quite impressed with it. PCI across the top and down the right-hand side. Two Ethernet adapters in here. I'm going to point out in a second the VGA port for a screen to the BMC service processor. There we go. The next one along is RS-232 to a dumb screen. This is the BMC Ethernet port, two USB ports, keyboards, all we can install from a USB key, four default Ethernet ports, and two power supplies. Let's remove one of these redundant power supplies. Nice strong handle, they're quite compact and heavy, although they're not redundant if you add an NVIDIA GPU accelerator. And we'll pop it back into the machine. Nice firm click. We're quite impressed with this. You can see the pen pointing at one of the grub screws. Mike will take out the other one. They're very small and easy to knock off the table and we found ourselves on our hands and knees trying to find them again. Mike's going to remove the top. You press down on these little buttons, then nudge the cover backwards. A bit tricky on the uh, bench where we can move around. We can see the disc at the front there. Then there's a row of much larger fans than we find on the Stratton. There's only four of them here. Then we have the CPUs under those black covers with the memory. Power supply underneath here. In the top middle, we have a graphics adapter. Over here, we have a couple of the Ethernet adapters. In here, we can put some more in there. Here's the uh, fans again, and we can see the cables running out to the discs at the front. Mike's going to point out we can just see the ends of the two disk drives in those two bays, and we have two fillers in those. And then we've got one, two, three, four larger fans. In the Strat, in the one new machine, there's eight fans. Here we have much, much larger fans, but just need the four. So quite well designed. There's a little clip. You grab hold, release the clip, and up they slide. And we'll be doing the same, putting that uh, back. You have to line it up with the little slots, and then it uh, just push it home, and a nice clunk. Looking from the back now, Mike's going to take out the rightmost adapter cage, release the locking pin, give it a little sharp tug to get it up out of the slot. We can see two Ethernet ports in here. If we look in here, we can find another port for a double height card. I think that's where the second graphics adapter can go. We can see uh, some labels there, push to snap. I don't like that terminology. Some people take that as a challenge to try and break it. If you slot it in firmly at the back so it's going to match up, 
there's a pin there that needs to slide in as well you push it in and then that slot goes back into the motherboard and then if you just run your fingers across here you see they're all nice and flat we know we got it in Next we move to the middle I.O. adapter cage, release pin there and we'll give it a tug up. We have a large graphics adapter in here which is one option, you could have other adapters in here but the graphics adapter comes with an extra power supply connector here. Welcome back, we've disconnected that uh, power cord so Mike can lift this out and turn it over so we can have a look at it. Here's the slot for the, another adapter at the back. We'll turn it over and we can see the actual uh, Tesla NVIDIA graphics card, we call it the K80. It's quite uh, heavy and uh, this is where the connector came out and here's the actual connector for the extra power. With the adapter cages removed, Mike will take off the air conduit that keeps the air moving through the machine. Very hard plastic, it's pretty tricky to put it back in. Some of the verticals need to go between the CPU heat sinks that you can see here and the uh, memory dims. Bigger fans, bigger airflow, bigger gigahertz for the Power 8. This is the storage controller. The blue cables run over to the disks which can be set or, or set. Those four shiny heat sinks between the dims are the level 4 memory caches that gives our memory such good performance. This is a PCIe disk storage adapter. We have SATA and SAS. Mark's releasing a little pin there and moving a little door out of the way. Then we can ease the PCI adapter out. Down these cables we have the 12 disks, all of them running off this little set of cables, out to the back. If we move that out of the way, there we can see the BMC service processor. I added four more disks and a couple of adapters slid into the rack. These first two are SSDs, 960 gigabytes. There's a little tab down in here. If you pull that out, you can see the machine type model and the serial number of the machine. And you can actually read it. That's a first from IBM without needing a microscope. This is the Stratton above and it has a similar tab over in the same corner. We're running Ubuntu on the SSD, but the other 10 drives are now ready to be RAID 5 for protection. Now if you pan out, you'll see that our Breggs and Stratton are in a small 11U rack. At the top in here, there's a VGA and keyboard. We can use this to do the initial boot to put the service processor up on the right network. We're using this small rack because it has nice square holes, which means it will fit in. The Briggs and Stratton don't fit into the regular T42 power rack because they have round holes. So let's take a look at some of the options we have available with this new machine. It's the IBM Power 8 S822LC 8001-22C. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the Super Micro Briggs machine. If we take the cover off, we can see some bits of the internals of the machine, but not a lot. If we take out these I.O. cages and the um, air conduit for uh, allowing the airflow to cool the machine properly, then we end up with this level of detail. Just to be clear, the front of the machine is on the right of our picture. That's where the disks go, the 12 bays. At the rear we have the two power supplies and then the PCIe slots and cages go there. Now you can push this machine with one socket active or two sockets active. I haven't seen a way to upgrade. In those sockets you can put, for example, one or two of the 8-core Power 8 processor running at 3.3 GHz or one or two of the 10-core Power 8 processor running at 2.9 GHz. The difference between these two processors is actually quite small in cost terms, so it's up to you to decide which is better for your particular workload. If you have a fewer number of threads, so you want to give them the maximum performance, then the higher gigahertz might help out. If you're running, say, lots of virtual machines or very highly threaded Apache web servers, then perhaps the extra cores will give you some benefit. But it's up to you. By default, the processors will come with SMT8 switched on in the Linux operating system, and the CPU running variable frequency. So when the cores are not busy, they'll be clocked down to 2 GHz, that gives you reduction in your electricity bill. And when they go busy at an individual core level, then they're clocked up and they're actually overclocked to 3.9 or 3.5 GHz, depending on the starting GHz rating. This is a very fast version of the Power 8 processor. On the memory side of things, we have 16 DIMM slots. They are DDR4, 1600 MHz. 
from IBM you can get 4, 8, 16 or 32 gigabyte DIMMs. If you buy your DIMMs from somewhere else, then we may ask you to remove those other DIMMs uh, to give you support. Of course, if your machine won't boot because there's no memory in it then, well, that's not our problem. The configurations that are allowed is if you have one Power 8 socket in use, then you must have eight DIMMs. If you have two Power 8 sockets in use, then you can have eight, 12 or 16 DIMMs. The four shiny heat sinks are the memory level four cache controllers, each of them running the four DIMMs around them. This is what gives us the brilliant memory performance. As a reminder, we have the 12 displays at the front of the machine. There's a lot of different disk storage options available. I guess this is where we're inheriting things from the Intel version of this Ultra server. Of the 3.5 inch disks, we have 2468 terabyte SATA drives. I think that's the default. We can also have SAS drives and start doing RAID, for example but we'll need a SAS adapter to run that. There's also two and a half inch disks. They fit in the same three and a half inch disk carriers. You'll see there's various different sizes there. They are SATA drives. We also have this NVMe, and I'm not gonna to pretend to be an expert on these things. These are popular, I know, with the Intel guys. There's lots of different sizes in here. You'll see some of them are the same size. These have different um, failure rates in terms of how many times you can overwrite the SSDs. For completeness then we have these four larger fans in the one used Stratton it had eight small fans. The larger fans actually shift a much greater volume of air through the machine. That allows us to go for these high gigahertz ratings for the Power 8 processors. We have the two redundant power supplies. If you got the two graphics adapters in here they are no longer redundant. That's because the graphics adapters take a lot of electricity and we can't run with just one power supply. Underneath the little disk adapter card there is the BMC service processor that is based on an ARM chip. Just a quick reminder around the back, two power supplies on the left, then we have a four port Ethernet unit. This is the uh, default, I think it's one gigabit. If you want uh, faster or clever Ethernet then you can add Ethernet adapters for those features or even uh, Mellanox. There are two USB 3 ports in the back, you can see the blue tabs there. We tend to use those for a keyboard along with the VGA screen in purple socket. We've also installed, for example, Ubuntu off a USB memory key. They have the BMC service processor Ethernet port. This is what to be used to access the machine IPMI to start it up and power it off. And we can also get to the BMC provided website that it runs there that gives us a lot of information. An alternative to running the VGA screen and a USB keyboard, we could use a dumb screen. These are getting increasingly rare these days, but it is an option available. Then we have the five regular PCI adapter slots, two 16 lane, for example, if you want to use the graphics adapters, there'd be good slots for those. Then there's three extra eight lane ones. Uh, one of them is low profile. That'd be this one here. Going to do a very quick review of the adapters, there's so many of them. There's the four port Ethernet by default, but we also can add extra PCI adapters for uh, Ethernet, the 10 gigabit, uh, or even a cheap and cheerful 1 gigabit. We can also have the Melanix adapters if you want a highly integrated uh, cluster of machines running at the 100 gigabit level. On the storage side, we can add a SAS RAID controller. There's two different types of that. And we have an NVMe adapter. I'm not going to claim any expertise in there. Fiber Channel, I'll have more about if you want to put your data onto the SAN. Uh, perhaps you want to run big databases or websites and that's the way you want to go. We have 8 gigabit and uh, 16 gigabit from QLogic. Then we have the advanced function adapters. We can have one or two of the NVIDIA Tesla K80 GPU accelerator cards and we can have one of the CAPI adapters in there as well. So what operating systems do we support at the initial launch? There may be more later on and certainly later levels. Ubuntu 14 and 16 long-term releases. You can get three years support available with the box from IBM. We can also run the Ubuntu KVM. One little gotcha in there, the default SMT is SMT equals 8, but you need to switch it off to get that to work. Your virtual machines just will refuse to start. The command there is to switch it off is the PPC64 underscore SCPU underscore uh, minus minus SMT equals off command. Intuitively obvious to everybody. 
Uh, we've run successfully the uh, Ubuntu 16, the RHEL 7.2 and the SUSE 12 as virtual machines. There doesn't seem to be any problems there. I've only done the basic testing, of course, if you're trying something very clever, then, then you need to be more cautious in the early days. On the Red Hat size, RHEL 7.2 is supported. It does need a little fix to get the base adapters for Ethernet working. Again, you can order three-year support via IBM. And of course, there's other OSs available. Um, you can try anything you want at your own risk, of course, but of course, CentOS 7 is uh, available. That needs the same fix as the Red Hat. Um, and by default, there's no support, although you can purchase support for that now from IBM. Now, I have been hiding something from you. The name of the S822LC is for big data. And that just gets all the technical people saying, uh? Because it also does medium and little data. It does massive Apache websites. It will run any of the open source databases or relational database management systems. It will run virtualization with KVM for virtual machines and cloud. And it'll actually do high performance computing if you add in one or two of the NVIDIA GPUs. This is a good general purpose machine. In fact, it has fantastic CPUs, it has fantastic memory, and some very fast adapters out there. So it's like advertising a car specifically for your dual carriageway. And everybody's thinking, w why would you say that? Check the YouTube page for this video to find the official IBM announcements, although I had found a few errors while preparing this video. Better to go and have a look at the Red Book. There was an early draft out, but I know there's a team working on lots of updates. Final thoughts, we think this is an excellently engineered machine. The high gigahertz of the Power 8 chips makes it a fast machine. Lots of memory and lots of flexible options for the disks and adapters. One sad note is it's not supported on an IBM T42 rack. If you enjoyed this video and learned something, please click on the light thumbs up button below. We do like to get some feedback.